What's up? Welcome everybody. You're having a good night. Tonight's gonna be a little dark. I hate to tell you that, but I couldn't resist covering it because it was something I remembered on a live stream the other day with I don't know who I was talking to, or I think I was talking to Jamie, and we were talking about uh, Australia and the <laughs> events in Australia. What's that? And I remember that I'd read an essay from a supposed former Satanist. Uh, again, this is all going by what he claimed, so I don't know. There's no way to, you know, 100% verify these types of things. But, uh, and, and as you know, in the talks that we've done in the past, we kind of classify things in hard proof, uh, you know, first person testimony, which is like the next level down from hard proof, uh, and by hard proof, I mean court cases, you know, really well-documented books, these kinds of things, um, and then we've got people's personal testimonies about, you know, their abuse, many years ago, what happened to them when they were kids, which, not to say it's false, but it's also, you know, something that is very difficult to prove decades later, so we just simply don't know in a lot of cases, uh, you know, what the real story was, but that's not to say that they were lying or you know, something like this. So tonight we're going to be talking about this essay. Uh, that's not what's on screen right now. That's just uh, one of the uh, Wikipedia articles that I think will be somewhat relevant. Yeah, thank you. I'll tell you this guy. Time to see that. There we go. Hopefully nobody, hopefully y'all can still hear me, right? I know, I know. Yeah, so this is, a, 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 we're going to class this in the layer two, level two domain of things that are probably true. And so some examples of these things would be, as we said, first person testimonies. I would also say not just first person testimonies about what happened then, like, Transformation, the Kathy O'Brien book, or Kurt Barker's books, because those books have a lot of. Uh, is there two musics playing? Oh, I had two musics playing. Yeah. Oops. Is that better? That should be better. You can barely see those little icons to turn the music off, but. So this will be in the class of um, categories of things that. I like how people think that that's like. The, your test of IQ is how well you can click these little stupid icons. Um, so my IQ is low. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. My low IQ boy. I'm a, sl I'm, a I'm still a beautiful slow boy, even if I'm a slow boy now. Beautiful slow boys, mount up. Rough rider, easy riders, mount up. Anyway, what were we talking about? We weren't talking about Nate Dog. Just hit the east side of the LBC on a mission trying to find Mr. Warren G. No, we're not talking about Nate Dog. We're talking about the essay of the uh, former satanic priest claimed to be one of the heads of, I think he said he was the head of the outer order in previous decades. Uh, this person apparently passed away in 2010. But uh, with these kinds of documents, what I was trying to say is that if we think about the day tapes, right, Dr. Day tapes, uh, they kind of were in this amorphous, uh, unsure territory for a long time until we started seeing more and more of the world order unfolding in the ways that it has. And as a result of that, that kind of has vindicated the day tapes. So... Anybody that had skepticism about the, the day tapes, you can go watch the YouTube videos, The New Order of Barbarians, which covers the whole day tapes. Um, that, that's been proven, right? So we know the day tapes were authentic. That really was a uh, meeting of all of these doctors at the uh, Rockefeller uh, operation that they were running back in the late 60s. One doctor there happened to be pro-life, Dr. Day, and he tapes it, right? And he, uh, Richard Day, and so then we get the um, the full story of this sort of secret elite doctor meeting. 
And other, you know, meetings like this have also kind of been proven to be correct. We, the, the report from Iron Mountain for many years was lampooned as a conspiracy theory. And then it turns out that it was actually based on a real event. Uh, which Miles Copeland dis- uh, discusses in the introduction to Game of Nations. The, the real thing that the report from Iron Mountain is based on, and basically the report from Iron Mountain is correct. Uh, you know, Bilderberg Group, that was a semi-secret meeting for many, many years, and oh, uh, not every media outlet, but many media outlets ignored it or acted like it didn't exist. And then, of course, yes, Bilderberg does exist. Everybody knows about it. Now, the former head of Bilderberg is uh, Klaus Schwab. And so he's still on the committee and he's now running the World Economic Forum telling us that we will go into the the great research. You'll have nothing and you will like it. So this essay, and it's a pretty long essay. Uh, I read it twice because I really wanted to get the details right. I looked up a lot of the claims and sources and pretty much everything uh, matches up. So I would say that this is probably... Correct. It probably really was. Um, he seems to have knowledge of things that uh, a scam artist, in the sense of like not having any exposure to these cults or these societies, wouldn't have. Uh, I think it's pretty easy if you've researched a lot of this material over the years to figure out when somebody's you know BSing, and this sounds pretty authentic. And a lot of the uh, details that he recounts will line up with what we read about in regard to organized crime. So he's actually going to make a pretty open, clear argument that the, the way that this cult that he's in, and, and he's, of course, touting it as the greatest satanic uh, cult of all time or whatever. Uh, who knows? Maybe it was. I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, these people are very uh, prideful. So obviously they self-aggrandize to extreme degrees. So we will have to keep some... Uh, a degree of skepticism here. Um, he doesn't actually make any outlandish supernatural claims. Uh, rather, to the contrary, he will make some pretty uh, mundane claims when it comes to power, so to speak. But what we're going to notice is that the the worldview that he has is perfectly in line, not just with what's rolling out now, but with but with the worldview that we've seen the elites exemplify in the global elite book series. So we've covered 50 plus of these writings from the top geopolitical strategists, planners, social engineers, technocrats, etc., families, the last hundred years. And even though a lot of those people aren't outright quote Satanists, the plan is exactly the same. So it doesn't matter whether you're an atheist, Luciferian, Satanist, the plans are the same and they, they have a common agenda. So we can debate all day long about who's in what cult or in what sect, uh, which elite person is in this. It doesn't matter because the end goal is the same. And what we're going to see is that this guy's going to point out, uh, what does he go? He goes by the name Frater. Frat, and if you don't know, like in the satanic cults, that instead of father, they're, you know, if you're an, a, an ordained Satanist or high priest, you're Frater. Right? Ooh, Frater. Uh, he's, Frater 616 or something like that. I forget his name, but uh, yeah, 616. Um, Frater 616. So he will claim to be the uh, head of one of these uh, high satanic orders in Australia. And the reason that we're, we're focusing on this, the reason I remembered this essay that he wrote is because uh, of what it claimed at the time about Australia, which to me just seemed kind of far fetched. And I mean, I, you know, we we're not uh, we're open to conspiracy quote theories around here, so we we uh, we don't have a problem speculating about these kinds of things or and and making it clear when we're speculating. But at the time when I read this, and I was very you know into all the stuff that I'm still into. So I, I had a very clear picture of the world. I'd read a lot, even um, not as much as I have now, obviously. But I, I mean, I, most of the views I have now have not changed since 2010. So just acquired more information. But even I thought at the time, this is out there. Okay, I mean, this is a little much. Um, it's in the Fritz Springer territory of stuff. It's in the, you know, <laughs> but 
now what we've seen happen in Australia, um, I can believe that that Australia is a essentially an occultic satanic test bed and that uh, as he will claim in his essay that they have basically captured the government a long time ago uh now he's specifically just talking about the political intrigue and and works of his cult in just in australia and as you guys know we've covered uh, mk ultra in australia i did a whole uh, in-depth breakdown on my rock fin if you're not uh, familiar with that be sure and go check that out it's uh it's pretty wild i went pretty deep into I mean, I've studied this stuff for a long time. I read most of the books out there on MKUltra. Um, and there was stuff about Australia. I, I had no idea. I had no idea about all the operations. And you could probably, I'm sure it's all over the world. Right? I mean, it's this crazy. That doesn't mean that all the doctors in Australia knew what they were up to, right? Because the way MKUltra worked was that the CIA had basically set up these academic and university fronts and these groups like the Human Ecology Foundation and they were just using the research of the doctors through these fronts and foundations. So I'm, I'm quite sure that many, many of these doctors didn't know they were working essentially for the, the CIA. Um, or maybe some of them did. Some of them, I'm sure they did, right? I mean, that we, we saw in that series, there was actually a serial, uh, an MK Ultra doctor who was a legit serial killer. Yes, an actual serial killer <laughs> hired to be an MK Ultra doctor. Dr. Harry Bailey, who did a bunch of uh, sleep experiments and basically just put everybody uh, to death, right? It's like a, like a mind controlled Jack Kevorkian, by the way. And I, I don't know, I've not read much about Dr. Kevorkian, but I kind of think he's probably one of these guys too. He's probably a, uh, I mean, I don't know if he's an MK Ultra doctor, but I wouldn't be surprised. And if you look up his artwork, his artwork is, I mean, this, he's a serial killer, right? I mean, all the serial killer artwork, we, as we've discussed on our serial killer stream series, uh, it's always satanic, right? Um, the themes are replete with the satanic, the demonic, human sacrifice, cannibalism. And that's literally all, that's everything that's in Kevorkian's art. So I probably should pull it up. I was looking for this, uh, the Inkeltra stream. Because everybody should hear that. I went really deep into... I can't find it. Oh, here it is. Secrets of M Culture. So if you go to my rock, over on the rock, baby. Right, you go over to the rock and you watch this one. It's going to tie in well with what we're talking about tonight. So there's that link. And yeah, let's do a little, uh, <laughs> a little brief analysis of... Old Dr. Jack's artwork. I mean, it's pretty rough, dude. So here's a dude uh, sliding off into hell, feet head first with his feet in your face. <laughs> I'm guessing, right? Here's another dude literally sliding off into hell. like, And then you can see that little demon face is down there ready to grab him. Um... Chopped off heads, blood dripping off the canvas, uh, literally a Roman centurion eating people. I mean, what? Um, a demon, multiple faces. So MPD, DID, possession, clearly what's going on with this dude, right? Uh, not hard to figure out. <laughs> uh, dude putting hands in his butt. I don't know what that is. What's going on there? Uh, Easter bunny uh, with a bowl of tricks on his head uh, and then looks like some kind of stupid YouTuber dude coming out of a Easter egg or is that supposed to be an evil Jesus I don't know what that is but obviously it's demonic blasphemous just I mean you, you don't paint this kind of stuff unless you're and I think some of these people are they do um, psychedelics too I would bet that K the Kevorkian was probably into psychedelics because a lot of the artwork looks quasi psychedelic right like this can you guys see this hopefully I'm showing yeah uh, I mean that's clearly a psychedelic thing more guts and cannibalism I mean what is wrong with these people uh a 
lily coming out of a skull. Uh, I don't know what that. Is. Look at this. Look at this nasty bitch getting a Jack Kevorkian tattoo all over her back. And look at the. She's got an all seeing eye at the top. What a lunatic. These people are nuts, dude. People have gone crazy. What is this? Something to do with. Oh, this is like. Uh, he painted this painting that Christianity and the Bill of Rights and the Constitution are trumped by Christianity. So Christianity is what has limited him from being able to have his demonic orgy feast of death and cannibalism. That's literally what, I mean, he even talks about that. He's like, the Christians are holding me back from my freedom. And we'll see that tonight that makes perfect sense with the stuff that we'd be looking at in terms of the so-called freedom that the satanic occult elite believe that they possess and believe that they will bring about in their quote aeon now somebody had a stupid bitchy uh, quote or comment fussing about the title of my video i don't believe that they're going to bring in a satanic aeon dummy i'm saying that this is their worldview uh, do I know if the, this is equivalent to the end times? No, I don't know that. We don't try to speculate and say if we know when the end times is. It could be, right? And the saints and elders say that when it is the end times, we'll know. I did a whole uh, two-hour talk on the beast system, 70 AD and all that. So go watch that first and uh, welcome everybody. I've got over 500 people. Wow, uh, big crowd. Welcome everybody. Be sure and hit like and share. And we're going to get into this guy's essay. Um, and I'm sure there's some people that know about uh, the background of Kevorkian, but again, it's just, it's striking that he would make artwork that looks just like the kind of artwork that uh, BTK does. It looks like uh, Gacy's artwork and painting. Um, it looks like the artwork of Mad Dog McKenna. So all these serial killers, right, they, they're impelled almost to like paint out these just disgusting fantasies so let's see let's get into um, Frauder's essay and I wanted to point out too uh, I don't know we, we may not get to all this because this is a long essay but the, I wanted to get into the similarities between materialism and uh, chaos magic I don't have any interest in chaos magic but I was listening to philosophy lectures and a lecture popped up in relationship to this person's essay as the father of modern magic that he recommended as uh, some, you know, great philosopher, right? So he, he was saying a lot of people think Crowley is the father of modern Satanism. He said, no, it's actually uh, Crowley that's the grandfather of modern Satanism. The real father is, oh, what's that guy's name? I just forgot it. Peter something. Peter Carroll. Yes, Peter James Carroll, the father of chaos magic. And of course, a lot of Hollywood people we know, a lot of musicians are into chaos magic. Uh, uh, what's that uh, weird band? The Antwoord, they're into chaos magic. Johnny Depp says he's into chaos magic. Uh, anyway, uh, some other people I'm sure. But uh, now, why this matters? Well, what, what was interesting, and, and I think maybe I'll do a different talk on this subject, but... The reason chaos magic was interesting is not because of the Hollywood people or whatever, but because it's so similar to Kantianism and the materialist worldview. Uh, because in the Kant, you know, uh, transcendental idealist system, uh, the world is really unknowable. You don't know what's out there. It's sort of, sort of chaos in a way. And so the structure that the world appears to have is just imposed by the mind, right? So ultimately, Kant, although he wasn't really a solipsist, the position can end up in solipsism. And when you get into solipsism, you're only a hop, skip, and a jump away from the idea of, say, a Carl Jung, that, oh, the reality is just a projection of your mind, dude. Right? So it's not just that you don't know the external world. Now it's actually your subconscious is projecting all of this. You're living in a dream, dude. Right? Like the Matrix worldview, this philosophy 101. Uh, idiots in philosophy 101 right having the conversation but what if we live in a matrix dude we don't even know it right literally that level of stuff now so how does this relate between materialism and well because in the materialist worldview uh consciousness is just an emerging property or an emergent property it just sort of sort of just springs out it's just chaos it just springs up right 
because all there was was matter. There was a inexplicable bang. It gave birth to matter. Matter spun around and did a bunch of boring shit for millions of aeons. And then that turned into like a belly button lint that spins and spins and spins. And it turns into a planet. And then the planet turns into a primordial ball of soup that gets hit by lightning. And then it cooks amoebas somehow. Right? It just happens, bro. And then the amoebas turn into apes. And then the apes turn into dinosaurs. And then that turns into... Blah. I'm joking, but... And then that turns into the humans, right? And then consciousness emerges, dude, right? Or maybe you have a Terrence McKenna of you that uh, there was a monkey that ate a mushroom, literally. And that, that's where consciousness comes from. There was a monkey one time that just tripped his balls off and became a man. He said, I am, because he was tripping so hard. So consciousness is literally a product of the mushroom or DMT. That's literally his view. Right? We've covered that. In our Global Elite book series, we actually did many of the Psychonauts. We've done multiple Psychonaut books. So, uh, the way that we get to materialism is through the pathway of the prior philosophers who may or may not have been esotericists or occultists or hermeticists themselves. Hegel, yes, we have, uh, we can show, we, we know that Hegel was influenced by Kabbalism and different Gnostic systems. Uh, Kant, perhaps, we don't really know. doesn't really matter. Uh, it's Spinoza, we know who was influenced by uh, a pantheism and these kinds of things. So these philosophers really set the stage for the revival, inadvertently. I don't think that all of them were intentionally trying to revive occultism, although some of them were. Some of them were into hermetic, you know, alchemical stuff. Newton was, right? They really just opened the doorway, set the stage for this revival of the 1800s, 1900s of the occult societies and that's where we're going to get to things like this of the oto the typhonian order and these kinds of branches off of a different germanic occultic european pagan and western hermetic alchemical traditions which themselves you could say are kind of branches perhaps out of freemasonry and these kinds of things right but uh modern satanism is is really also born from these same ideological pools and strains but one, one weird thing about the satanic groups is that they oftentimes want to provide a lineage, right? This is where you get the idea that for them, uh, they actually like it when somebody leaves Christianity who's a Christian priest because they believe they still have that power. And then this makes them all the more powerful as a Satanist priest, right? And that really has to do with the Roman Catholic perspective on ex opere operato. Right. For an Orthodox person, we don't believe that a priest who becomes a Satanist the day after he's ordained in the Roman Catholic Church can continue to confect the Eucharist. Right, That's not the Orthodox view. Roman Catholics do believe that, and you can see in the history of uh, European Satanism and black magic that that idea passed into their groups as well. In fact, you could even argue perhaps that ex opere operato is kind of a magic type of view. right? Because it doesn't matter what your faith is, you can be a total apostate, but you still possess this technology, this power to confect the body and blood of God, right? So you're sort of this God controller. Literally, that's how they view it, right? The, the Satanists, I'm saying, and they adopt that view, I'm saying, my claim, is that out of this aberration of the medieval Latin Roman Catholic view of the sacraments. Anyway, so... This individual uh, basically writing his kind of, uh, you know, last uh, essay memoirs and he's saying, um, you know, to, I guess, his followers or his group that a lot of people in the modern world don't realize it, but Satanism is flourishing, right? This, the occult and, and explicitly Satanism, not just Hermeticism, but the, the actual Satanic groups. And I think if we were to try to figure out what characterizes the various Satanic groups, uh, I think everyone knows that, you know, Anton LaVey's group is a kind of a more of a, of a front type of thing. It's more of an atheistic, just a kind of hedonistic group. But what this figure argues, this person, is that the uh, Church of Satan was really a front for his group. Uh, don't know whether that's true. I think it's probably likely that behind the scenes you had uh, people, powerful, wealthy people, right? Elites, black nobility, perhaps 
putting money into probably founding something like the Church of Satan, probably the CIA as well. I think the CIA, my, my guess, my suspicion is that not all the CIA, but elements within the CIA probably had a direct relationship and connection to the, the founding of the Church of Satan. He doesn't say that, but he does say that his cult does have a direct connect to uh, various intelligence agencies, including the CIA. And so he says that um, we are growing. A lot of people are uh, choosing uh, Satanism as an actual explicit open worldview. And he says people are not going to realize that or believe it. And they will continue on in their uh, blinded muggle worldview. Right. And he's right about this. Right. Now, this is a, an evil guy and he's explicit about his evil. He's glad that he's an evil guy. So when if you hear me saying that he's correct about certain things, I'm not advocating his worldview. I'm just saying that regardless of, uh, you know, evil or good, he's uh, factually correct in that statement. And he, he will say throughout this essay that you will see more and more Satanism. You will see open Satanism. You will see uh, Australia, you know, really exemplifying this. And guess what? Exactly. And he even goes so far as to say that Nobody will ever stop this precisely because they can't see it something spiritual. They have, he says, intentionally been blinded. Now, he thinks they've been blinded from his magic, right? Like their cult magic is literally intended, I'm not joking, to dumb you down. And he will say that. So whatever you think of the satanic groups or cults, right, you may think that it's all like uh, satanic panic Geraldo bullshit or whatever, right? Okay, you can think that, but it's a objective fact that this is the case. That's this is what these people believe, and this is what they say, and they even say this in the open. So again, remember we've covered this theme throughout, right? That putting this stuff in the open is a way to, you uh, know, it, it's a it's a way to kind of put a spell on you because it's a form of gaslighting. And it's a form of putting it in your face that you are a, a dumb sheep, right? And again, I'm not trying to say that the Satanists are good guys, but they're going to be, I mean, don't you think if Satan showed up, he would say correct things, right? He would say the world is, uh, you know, something that uh, I, 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 the world worships me inadvertently, Satan would say, and I know how the world works. I know how humans work. And really, Satan is kind of like the greatest con man, right? He's like the greatest, um, uh, what would we say, human compromiser, right? He knows, uh, it's like the line, there's a great line in Devil's Advocate, right? When, uh, hoo-ha, right? Uh, uh, what's his name? I just went blank. Al Pacino says, I'm a fan of man, right? He's a fan of man. Not really, but he's a fan of man in the sense of I love to play the heart, the strings of man because man is so easy to dupe because all you got to do is appeal to his base desires, right? And that way we could look at the seven sins or the, you know, those, these classic uh, ideas of the, the vices as ways to uh, entrap you. So we're going to look at Satan in this way as if he's like the great intelligence handler right you could think of him that way right he's not a fan of man in the sense of liking man right he's a fan of man in the sense of like uh man is, is just such a funny you know predictable creature and again in that sense you will you will be surprised that in the world today there's really only two groups that really understand what's going on in the world and that's serious committed occultic satanists luciferians and Christians. That's it. No one else can really figure out what's going on. Now, there's people who get parts of the story right. There's people who figure out geopolitical, you know, machinations, and they figure out conspiracies at one level, and who was behind this fake flag operation. Yeah, people figure that kind of stuff out, right? But you're going to notice that this guy has the full picture. Like, he knows what's going on. And one reason he knows what's going on, as he himself says, is that he talks and and worked with intelligence agencies. And he says basically that they had compromised, hello, compromised a lot of the Australian political structure. Now, we've seen multiple documentaries about Satanism, 
uh, PEDO and organized crime in Australia in the last year. Uh, we've covered it in multiple talks, the serial killer talks, right? We got, we went deep into that. And this essay only s serves to confirm all of that information and research. So you're going to get a heavy dose of truth tonight. Uh, can you take it? Right, That's the question here. Uh, and I want to remind you too, if you want to support the show, you can uh, ask your questions by a super chat. I will not read any questions that are completely ridiculous uh, or out of the bounds of due uh, sobriety and politities. Pol uh, that's niceties with politeness combine them. It's a new word, but so he says, I'm going to explain to you how this whole structure works. And he even kind of laughs about it. Like I just put it out there. I don't, I mean, care right now. He's, he's kind of anonymous, I guess. So nobody can really like say the, you know, but the fact that so much of this has proven true, I think gives validity to this. He says, I got into this occultic stuff back in the seventies. Um, in college, I went to these sort of, I think he says something like, uh, seances, I don't know, something goofy that turned into invitations to, uh, more ritual based uh, systems of magic and black masses and this kind of stuff. And he says, you know, it started with orgies and they, they draw people in. He says with like the sexy stuff, right? Oh, come to this, you know, sexy O R G Y. It'll be a lot of fun. And then he says the deeper that he got into it, it was, uh, he, he realized it was more and more connected with things like, like organized crime. Uh, and he says that the people who were really successful at what, what, brought in the money for his uh, group were the people that were able to have a legitimate business as a front and then doing criminal operations under that cover. And he says that's the way that a lot of these cults get money, as well as, he says, through connecting through intelligence agencies, black operations, these kinds of things. And he goes on to say that um, another big thing that his group uh, was involved in was the production of PRON. So not going to go into a lot of detail with that due to being uh, on this platform, uh, but you can imagine what kinds of stuff that we're talking about. And then he says that uh, a lot of people don't realize that Australia is sort of the global center, epicenter, as well as England, London and Australia, of the uh, global satanic network it's he says it is the supremely satanic government and and he's going to give some pretty interesting statistics to prove that because he says uh you will see crazy things happen in australia and brutal oppression that will prove me correct he says and wow right that's why i remember this essay because what has happened in the last two years right now, uh, let's get back, though, to what he, he his recounting of this. He says that uh, one thing that uh, I learned pretty early on, he said the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey's group, that was a front, uh, a front for uh, our group. And he claims, again, I don't have any way to vindicate this, but he claims a whole list of famous people who were members of uh, his, you know, he never says exactly what his group is. So I'm, we don't know who, who exactly his cult is. It could be a number of different types of uh satanic groups or cults who knows but uh, or he's it could be some unknown thing right who knows but he claims a bunch of the list of famous people including uh presidential families Sam, everybody knows sammy davis jr yeah, yeah. Um, he claims cult leader garner ted armstrong was actually not a pseudo christian but actually a satanist i think that's possible um he had mentioned ed heath which everybody knows i think later on that that guy Right after all of his uh, crimes uh, in the UK government, that was clearly the case with him. He claims people like Reagan, uh, right? Ronald Reagan was in a cult. J.P. Morgan, he says. Uh, so anyway, then he goes on to say, uh, but you can't always believe these people, right? Because yes, yeah, Satanists they they lie, right? I mean, they they actually have the intention of breaking the Ten Commandments. So we never know if they are telling the truth. We take it with a grain of salt. But uh claim let's see then he goes on to say that uh everybody will recognize famous high-ranking military people who were part of of his circles and groups 
probably Aquino, maybe Temple of Set, right? So, I mean, I think he's definitely talking about Michael Aquino, but he mentions other military men as well who were part of satanic networks. Then he talks about the women that he met. And this is kind of surprising because I think a lot of people don't think about really uh, evil, wicked women being committed to these groups. And he takes great pride in that. In fact, he says that when it comes to the PRON uh, and acts of uh, what we'll call degradation, he says that the women excelled at this. And that matters because now we begin to see it tying into the organized crime, right? The organized crime, which we've covered in our mafia series, which people didn't, they watched part one, a lot of people watched part one and they didn't watch part two. Uh, when then we covered in the, uh, serial killer series which we still have more to do there's plenty of serial killers to do there's never there's a never uh, there's always more serial killers right but we see the parallels again between what his cult are, are, are doing what he's saying his cult does the black operations money uh, operations that they're involved in uh, and that they're tied to the um, high level political elite in Australia and he says they have obviously police judges on the payroll, doctors, right, uh, you know, all strata of society, PhDs. And he says that uh, we intentionally corrupt and are corrupting. So you have to keep in mind that this goes perfectly in line with what Klaus says. Well, Klaus doesn't explicitly say it. He kind of does when he says that we'll subvert democracy and take it over. It's more so in line with the way Lockstep presents the collapse. Right, because remember at the end of lockstep in scenario one, it says uh, when when we corrupt the system, it just accelerates, it furthers the collapse, and then that allows the new system to come into play. So they don't mind. Right? I, I was listening to people protesting politicians and, and jeering at you know Biden and and jeering at uh, Trudeau or whatever, and I'm just sitting there thinking like after I'd read this guy's essay. Not that I didn't know this already, but I'm reading this guy's essay. I'm like, they don't care if you jeer at him. In fact, they think it's funny. So people go, I'm going I'm to go, I'm gonna go tell Justin Trudeau what I think. But he, he, like, he cares what you think. <laughs> These are committed Satanists. They don't care what you, in fact, they think it's funny that you protest them. So you have to understand, not everybody is as good as you. In fact, a lot of people see that, as, these people see that as a weakness, Right? that you project your goodness onto the world is seen as a preeminent form of weakness. Now, I'm not saying that we should assume the, the most evil of other people, but it is an issue of discernment when we figure out, well, now, actually, if we live in a really degenerate age, then when it comes to powerful leaders, yes, we probably should assume evil, right? So you can't, don't be naive, don't be stupid, and pay attention to what he's saying because a lot of what he's saying has happened. Right? Again, this is written in 2010. So this is 11 years ago. Uh, so he goes on to say uh, his organization was connected to a lot of high-level political pe people, um, was connected to magical orders in UK and other places like this. Uh, he mentions this woman. He, doesn't, he never says who she is, but he says uh, Lilith. She, her, she, her occult name is Lilith. If you don't know, these people take names just like people in the Orthodox Church take a saint's name, right? You take Athanasius, Daniel. Well, these people take evil names. <laughs> so her name was Lilith. Um, and it, he talks about there being breeders. He talks about there being uh, lodges that were specifically connected to police departments and he says that his group had a direct connect to the CIA, uh, people in the CIA, not the whole CIA, but people in the CIA via the black market operations. Um, and this is interesting, and I think this is true, uh, especially with what we've seen in terms of the scandals, both not just in the Roman Catholic Church, but also, remember, guys, in the evangelical world. A lot of these corrupt, fake, evangelical megachurch pastors, some of them are Satanists. Okay? They're not just con men. They're not just people making money. Now, if you watch True Detective, that was actually based on an actual evangelical cult, I think in Louisiana. It was in, there's a Daily Mail article you can pull up about the basis for True Detective Season 1. And that was a satanic group 
running an evangelical front. And I mean, it should be obvious why they do this, right? It's a great cover, right? If you're running a cult, if you're running a black operation, a con operation, or if you're a Satanist to pretend to be a Christian. So he goes on to say that uh, not only do powerful Satanists run some of the top uh, escort agencies in Australia, he says they also get money from running sophisticated evangelical new right conservative churches. Hmm. Is that hard to believe? Remember, who was that goober guy who was supposed to be the uh, advisor to Bush? W? Remember him, the evangelical goober who was caught with doing meth with like Skittles men? Remember him? I'm sure everybody in the chat. I can't remember that. I never remember that guy's name. I can see his goober face because he's got, he's got this smile like this. Remember that guy? Bush's spiritual advisor, this mega church pastor. I was like, dude, come on. <laughs> who, who is so stupid as to believe this, right? Well, a lot of people are. Uh, so, Ted Haggard? Ted Haggard. That's it. I remembered it. You remember that? I don't know if Ted Haggard is a saint. I'm just saying that he would fit the bill of the kind of thing that this guy is describing, right? Like mega church front. And we've covered in many cases mega church fronts. He's not talking about Billy Graham. Oh, well, I mean, Billy Graham could have certainly have been in this scenario, but he's not. I think he's talking about. Um, now, we know Billy Graham was a CIA so That's in Ingdahl's uh, uh, book, Last Hegemon, documented there. And it's in um, probably, I could see those people. Yeah, it was Ted Haggard. Uh, anyway. So then he goes on to say, uh, what's next? Oh, this was crazy. Two big goals right away. He says, we have two big goals in our group to meet by 20. The, the first goal is 2010 and the next goal is 2030. So the 2010 goal, he said, was to make the Western world is essentially illiterate, functionally illiterate. And then by 2030, to depop the globe's population at least 70%. 2010, functionally illiterate in the West, because the Western world is, you know, leading leads the world, I guess, in literacy, so to speak. And then by 2030, 70% reduction of population. So there you go. Right away, we immediately see two key global elite goals that perfectly align with a satanic goal not just to severely reduce the global pop but to severely reduce the literacy and functionality of people in especially the west and i think a large part of that ha has happened i mean i don't think that i mean obviously the whole west isn't totally illiterate but uh they have at least achieved some of that goal and he says um the governments, he says, of the West count on their sheeple to respond in a typical infantile fashion. This includes unconsciously identifying with a more powerful force, even if it enslaves. In fact, the more that the government brutalizes and humiliates them, the more so this is the case. Uh, hello. Have you seen a better example of that than in the last two years? So this, this guy, you can look at him as like a like like a satanic intelligence operative person basically looking at the lay of the land in his country and saying these people are so domesticated and so dumbed down that the more they're brutalized the more they will cry out for more tyranny hello this was written 11 years ago then he moves on to say uh some of the great strategists of using our methodologies he says were people like kissinger now he doesn't explicitly say kissinger was a satanist but he says that kissinger had this great idea to co-opt evangelicals and bible believers because of their stupidity right the moral majority type thing so he says use them to sort of marshal their energy and their their uh focus 
towards things like the war on the Teresh, right? To use the phrase of W. And he says that was supreme. That was a, a, a fantastical success to to take these evangelical goobers and focus their intention, their attention, and their their energy and their money towards foreign geopolitical operations. Um, he backs up the claim. He doesn't mention uh, what's her name. He doesn't mention Kathy O'Brien, but he does say that. Uh, Gerald Ford was a was he claims Gerald Ford was part of his cult and that's something that Kathy O'Brien claims he says basically this idea of Kissinger and Brzezinski as well is strategy of tension and strategy of tension is just a basic way to keep you in perpetual fear that's all right it's literally just constant fear and he says this is really the the fundamental essence of this whole system how it works right and if we think about it right i mean what does satan do right this the the thief comes to steal kill and destroy right fear is essentially i mean unholy fear is like the central key power element uh of satan right And he says, the public will never catch on to this. They're totally unaware. They, they cannot conceive of the fact that there's a plan at work here. And this, this is correct. I think we can give this guy, for all of his evil, we have to admit he's correct about this. Right? The public just can't recognize that it's more than corrupt government leaders. It's more than incompetent government officials right how many people in the turn on the normie radio and what are they tell well they've got such an incompetent group of people in washington i can't believe uh, how incompetent george biden is george bush is uh, they're so incompetent no they're not incompetent the very thing that this guy said 10 years ago would happen has happened it's a plan it's not incompetence right you're being dumbed down you're being r-a-p-e-d you're undergoing, you're, you're being terrorized. And he says that we love that strategy of tension and, and this terror. He says entities like the Federal Reserve, right? The Federal Reserve takes your money. It takes your wealth and your energy. He says we love that because it's vampiric and essentially all of this worldview is, is a predator prey, predatory relationship. You're just cattle. You're just there to be food. You're a battery for our matrix, right? And he says, and, and from this perspective, and this is why it melds so well, he says, with social Darwinism, is that you're subhuman, he claims. And he says that the terror techniques that uh, Kissinger and these people came up with, Brzezinski, the strategy of, of tension, he says, all this does is uh, build a powerful sense of tension in society. This technique of building tension finds a, a scapegoat, which we will call here the dark path. This, uh, excuse me, the, the dark path adepts know, he says, what the scapegoat is, because the scapegoat becomes the society's, the elite's targeted enemy, right? So they just make up fabled enemies, right? Fabled enemies he says, are only known to those who are in the dark path because they can see the real plans, the real strategy. He says, the muggles are blinded to it. They can't see what's going on. And he says, anybody who did understand what was going on would understand that the strategy of tension in the war on terror is not a war against a foreign enemy. It's a war on the public. It's a war on you. You are the object of the war on the terror the terrorist you're either with us or it's a terrorist right all this bush nonsense and he says uh, you can see this very clearly in the domesticated uh enslaved population in australia he, he says who, who are some of the dumbest and worst people that, that's his view <laughs> not, not mine that's what he says <clears throat> he says if you doubt me he says then look at the western world as a whole he says, you have privately run banks that take all your money through taxes. He says that you are uh, increasingly dumbed down each year. He says that you are spiritually blinded by a delusion. 
that's, I mean, he's basically saying what the Bible says. Now, he doesn't believe the Bible, right? This guy's evil, but he's evil enough to know that, or to have at least a, some sense of what's actually going on. So he goes on to say that, uh, I wanted to, this was interesting to do with um, the government in Australia. He says, well, actually, I can't read all that. That part's a little too too much for the uh, YouTube audience. I can't read that. So we'll, this will be a half an hour. So that, by the way, if you want to see the second half of this, where I will go into more to do with uh, materialism, the chaos magic, more to do with uh, some of the things that you can't really talk about on YouTube with this guy's essay, you can subscribe to Jay's analysis to the second half of this. Um, I'll talk about how uh, chaos magic ties into there being no meaning. I'll talk about uh, famous people who uh, are no longer with us, uh, who, uh, well, I won't say, but we'll talk about what they mean by the Aeon and this kind of stuff. Uh, we'll talk about some of this book from Craig Heimbichner, which deals with cults like this. And uh, then we'll deal also with this essay from Carl Jung, which is called Aeon. Uh, and Jung wrote this essay, which I think summarizes a lot of these worldviews in a really concise five. It's a famous five page essay, but it's actually, it's actually pretty hard to find. Uh, I couldn't find this essay for many, many years. And then I did remember that it was in one of my college textbooks. So I dug it out. And they reproduced, um, it's called Problem of Evil. And they reproduce the Crow Young essay, Aeon. And yeah, so let's get back to this guy's essay. So he basically says that, let me put it this way. And the, the, if you think about it, this is an interesting argument uh, on the, the, from the vantage point of if you're an atheist or a materialist. He says, uh, as speaking as a, a self-conscious occultist, a Satanist, he says, if Christianity isn't true, then normies are actually basing their morals on a purely pragmatic basis, right? He's saying, look, the Western world doesn't believe in the so-called Christian values that undergird their society anymore. Most of them, right? He's speaking in general. Yeah, that's true, right? Modern, the modern world has basically rejected its Christian roots. And he says, now, if that's the case, then when you people in the Western world who aren't religious, who aren't Christian, who aren't spiritual, when you appeal to morality, when you try to have moral foundations, he's speaking of the, the masses, there's really no reason for it. It's just convention. It's just pragmatic, right? Well, I, I'm a hold to these values, I guess, because, you know, society does, and I'll get along in society better if I do that. And he has a point that, well, now, wait a minute. But why should we do that? <laughs> so on what grounds would you reject somebody who's a person committed to evil if you have that worldview? If it's just pragmatism, then on what basis is a normie able to reject the pragmatic hedonism of a Satanist? So we see a kind of a, a Nietzschean dark logic at work here, which is actually a little more consistent, you could say, if there's no God, right? God doesn't exist. Christianity is not true. Anything goes. <laughs> I mean, right? Uh, yeah, I know. We're ex we're excluding the possibility of other worldviews uh, at this point. Not because I'm interested in debating that at this point, but he's just talking about the Christian West, right? And he's saying that most people in the West have a sort of pseudo-Christian worldview or the ghost of a Christian worldview, but there's no reason to believe it. And he says, and if that's the case then you don't have any pragmatic basis to critique what we do, right? He's saying the Satanist guy. And he says, yes, we use mind control. Yes, we brainwash people. Sure. But on what basis is that wrong? Because he says, isn't it self-evident that the masses are just a herd? And if the masses are just a herd, and if Darwinism is true, which he takes as a given, which, you know, we, we don't believe in Darwinism here. I critique Darwinism all the time. He says, if Darwinism is true and if the masses are just a unevolved cattle herd, then there's nothing wrong with 
what any of these cults or sects do. Objectively speaking, you may not like it, but you not liking it has nothing to do with the true or the false. Right? And he says, if you don't like it and if you want to be consistent, you would have to then reject the very thing that these groups do. Use terror, fear, mind control, brainwashing. Oh, wait a minute. That's what your government does. You see. So he's basically saying, if you default to doing what Kissinger, Brzezinski, and Klaus say, and they brainwash you and abuse you and, and misuse you, then on what basis do you say that the satanic group is bad, <laughs> right? Because you, you see, he's pointing out a valid inconsistency. Now I'm going to show you, we're going to see that uh, when it comes to this worldview, this worldview is not accurate. In fact, they will argue that there is no reason or logic. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then you don't have an argument against other worldviews, right? So we can do a presuppositional critique very simply to dismantle this whole worldview as relativism and nonsense and absurdity, clearly. But at the same time, he's actually making a good point, like, like David Hume, right? David Hume was an atheist. As a presuppositionalist, we often point to the fact that David Hume makes really good arguments, he points out bad theistic arguments, and we give him credit. Yes, exactly. These are dumb theistic arguments, a lot, oftentimes. But that doesn't mean that this position, the atheist position, the satanic position, is necessarily correct, because they're going to do the same thing. They're going to turn around and contradict by saying that the highest good is just me as an individual. Well, now, wait a minute. If the highest good is you as an individual and you're just a particular individual, then there's no higher good, right? And that's when they have to resort to, oh, well, okay, but then reality is just a projection of my mind. They have to resort to a form of solipsism. Oh, okay, well, if solipsism is true, then you can't actually know that solipsism is true. Well, wait, how? Because if solipsism, if your mind is just, the, is what has projected your whole reality and it's just a projection then there's not anything that's really true or objectively knowable, right? We're back to the Kantian dilemma. And essentially it boils down to like Maya or illusion, right? The whole, every, oh, it's just a dream, dude. Okay, well, if everything's illusory or a dream, then you're coming to know that it's illusory or a dream is also illusory and part of the dream. So you, you don't have any footing, right, to ever have a place to say this is true, this is false. Because it's all false. It's all it's all illusion, you see. And literally most of these esoteric and occult worldviews, I'm not joking, it's this dumb, boil down to saying, reality is just a projection of your mind, dude. So if like you train your mind with a bunch of magic and meditation and rituals, you'll change reality, bro. That's literally the whole thing. That's what they think. All of it. That, that's the whole worldview is just change your mind and how you think, and that will change reality. It's like the secret, like Oprah level shit. I'm not joking. It's Oprah level stuff. Okay. But whether this guy is aware of that all being a lie or not, I don't know. Uh, regardless, most people fall for this stuff, not because of its logical consistency, as this guy says, but rather because it appeals to man's base desires. And that's the strength, not just of Satanism or the world that we live in nowadays it's really just about controlling people through base desires there is a sense yes in which the herd is easily manipulated but they're easily manipulated precisely because many degenerate elites brutalize the masses intentionally doing this intentionally beating them down uh despising them for the purpose of getting rid of them and he totally admits all that right here. He says, yes, absolutely, 100%. And I think what's the most telling part is the, the sections I won't go into here because it's, it's a little much for YouTube. But, uh, and I'm not going to, even in the part two, I'm not going to get really gross or, or anything like that. But he basically just says it's a degradation ritual. Now, we've covered that many times with the pop stars. We all, we've all seen the pop stars go from being the innocent girl to being the... Um, lady of the evening to put it nicely 
And why do they do that? Because it's ritual. It's, it's, a, it's a practice of traumatization, not just for the people who are the pop stars, but also for the masses. Have you not figured out that the pop stars are oftentimes doing the same cult stuff? Is it an accident that they all like Crowley? Uh, I wonder what's going on. It's not hard to figure this out. It's all in the open. But you are intentionally kept blind because I think two things are going on here, right? We'll do the, on the on, from the vantage point of the bad guys, the evil people, they believe that their degradations and their rituals and what they do literally affects the spiritual realm. This is what they believe to blind people. Uh, in a spiritual sense. And it, in a sense, I think that does seem to happen, right? Now, that doesn't mean that they have all this magical power. What I think happens is that from the perspective of God, from the Christian perspective, God allows these delusions, right? Read 2 Thessalonians, where God allows these delusions. Uh, and then the delusions are they entrap those who willfully believe the delusions, right? That's the way Second Thessalonians, it says basically that those who do not believe, they have their minds blinded by the God of this age, who's Satan, so that they will not believe the truth, but will believe these lies, these spiritual delusions. Somebody's asked about the website. Look, there's one tab on the website. It's called the members section. And everything that I do here is on the website. There's a few things that I do exclusive to Rockfin. Nothing has changed. The fact that I'm doing more content on Rockfin has not changed from the content on the website. Nothing's different. So there's no reason to be confused about how to watch things on the website. Nothing has changed. Anyway, so if you would, please support the stream through Super Chats. We'll get to those in a minute. But uh, one of the things that, they, that this guy goes on to say next uh, is the recruitment of street kids. And he says, yes, we've done very well with this. Now, where do we hear about that? Oh, this has been going on for a long time. Charles Manson did this. Manson recruited street kids to be part of his it, satanic cult. Now you say, wait a minute, Charles Manson. Well, yes, he was. Charles Manson was out, coming out of the Process Church, which is a Luciferian satanic group. And it went back to Process, right? These same types of groups. I don't know if this guy was necessarily connected to that. He, he, he's not. But th there is a connection between the Br British satanic groups, this guy, and Process. And that's well known. Jimmy Savile wrote essays in the Process Church magazine, as did Charles Manson. So he says, we uh, recruit a lot of street kids. We use them for all kinds of things. We brainwash them, blah, blah, blah. And we've seen this with the serial killers. The serial killers, what do they do? The exact same thing. Now, get this. He even goes on to say, we study serial killers, psychopaths. He says, we study them and we uh, uh, emulate them. And here's an odd statement I didn't expect. He says, in fact, some of the deadliest, most effective uh, uh, assassins in the world have in fact been women. And he claims they were part of his group. I don't know if that's true, but he says, yes. Uh, and, and he says, uh, some of these women are in fact dedicated to ISIS or Lilith. Um, I think that's probably true. Yeah. Then he goes on to say that one example. Now, I didn't know who this person was. I'd never heard of this person, but he this this guy claims, not saying it's true. This guy claims that a couple of people in his group that are well known uh, is the Greek princess Ekaterini. So Princess Catherine of Greece, he claims. Now, I looked her up. Uh, she's no longer. She uh, died. I don't know when years ago. Um. But he claims that she was part of his, whatever his group is. Entirely possible. We do know that the, you know, elites, uh, royals, right? These people have had a long history. Not everybody, obviously, many royals have been saints. But also many royals have been totally evil degenerates, obviously. So, who knows? Very plausible, uh, especially we get into the higher grades of 
uh, European nobility and people that are you know, long time, you know, generational hint, 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 uh, Masonic and magical families, orders. That's very well known. Not, not debatable there. Uh, he mentions different intelligence assets and agents who had connections to his cult. And then here's an interesting statement. He, he says, uh, echoing Arthur Kessler, Bertrand Russell, H.G. Wells, uh, John P. Holdren, Paul Ehrlich, the water, the Western water supply is intentionally laced with things that dumb the population down. And he says, even though it's in the public well known, he says that it's people are so stupid and dumbed down that they can do it in the open and nobody even knows. And that's true. That's true. Uh, then he goes on to talk about more famous government people I never heard of. I guess these are uh, Australian government people. I don't know who they are. Um, this is back in the 60s and 70s. He's talking about people back then that were doing crazy stuff. Then he says uh, uh, one example you look at is the Pine Gap facility in Australia is a uh, connected to the NSA, which is interesting. He says that uh, Michael Aquino had a role in that. The NSA Pine Gap connection there. Um, he goes on to talk about a uh, like a satanic version of the Nicene Creed. So apparently there's a there's a, there's a, a satanic version of the Nicene Creed. I didn't know that, but we will stop there because we've been going for about an hour and twenty minutes. Um, we'll get into uh, as we said in part two, Carl Jung's essay Aeon, how it outlines a satanic philosophy. Um, and one of the groups that he mentioned that they want to talk about was uh, this Typhonian order, right? Which is one of the splits. And so there is a Germanic connection, not in the sense of bloodlines, but a Germanic connection to Carl Kellner, Kenneth Grant, not Kenneth Grant, but Kenneth Grant coming out of, um, he's British, but there was a connection between Theodore Royce, Carl Kellner, and British occultists. There we go. Uh, who were these ger uh, wealthy German industrialists, Carl Kellner. So again, remember that a lot of the origins of these modern cults literally come out of wealthy people. Uh, and Kellner and then Germer, who ended up being imprisoned by the uh, NAZIS. And then what survived out of that was the Agape Lodge in California, and this is where we get uh, uh, what's his name, L. Ron Hubbard and uh, JPL. I just went blank. You know what I'm talking about Jack Parsons, right? But there's a split off of this. There's another branch which is Kenneth Grant's uh, Typhonian Order, and if you watched my analyses of uh, what's his name. David Lynch's season three, we got into some of the Kenneth Grant mob zone stuff that, that tied into season three. Anyway, the point is not to go into all this. I'm not saying that this guy's group is this group. He doesn't say that. He just says that uh, he met a lot of the people in these groups. So again, I don't know who, who is who, and it doesn't really matter ultimately except to understand that um, these groups like the Germanic OTO groups and whatnot, they're directly connected to the intelligence agencies there and they're directly connected to the intelligence agencies in the UK and those groups and circles because we know Crowley was an MI5 asset for a while. We know that British intelligence had a great interest in the occult groups, uh, Dennis Wheatley, right? Uh, we know uh, Ian Fleming based many characters like Le Schiff, Blofeld on Crowley. So that's well known. And we also have to keep in mind that in California with that Agape Lodge with Jack Parsons, everybody's heard of Jack Parsons. Now they made whole TV shows, right? CBS whole series on Jack Parsons and him being part of the Agape Lodge. So then that's where we get into right, the American intelligence group because Parsons was actually uh, leaking secrets to other countries, if you didn't know. So Parsons was doing intelligence espionage operations. He got in trouble, I think, for doing that at the time. Uh, totally crazy psycho dude Parsons was uh, just insane right and by that I mean like rituals with his mom 
if you catch my drift, right? <laughs> this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. I'll stop there. Uh, again, this if somebody really wants, you can find this essay. It's public. Now, what's hard to find is the full essay. Uh, I did find it after some searching, and it's about 20 pages total. So you can find it. Um, but in part two, I'll get into their philosophy of history in the sense of how they see uh, cyclical history and where it's going and how they think that they're going to bring in a satanic aeon. Now, I, I'm not saying they're going to bring a satanic aeon. Uh, it could be the end times. It could be an antichrist system that coincides between the Christian perspective and what these guys are saying. It could be, or maybe it's not the end of the world, and these people just have sort of delusions of grandeur and how they're going to set up a global government. Um, but regardless, what we've seen is that the goals are the same as what we've seen in the writings of the elite. So it really doesn't matter uh, whether this elitist is an atheist or that elitist is a Satanist because ultimately it's the same game plan. It's the same end goal and it's public and old essays like this, which at the time just sounded really outlandish, don't sound outlandish anymore, especially when we look at the fact that right, it talks about like Jeff Stein Effery type operations. Literally, he says, we use Jeff Stein Effery. He doesn't say jeff epstein but he says we use those operations to compromise all the politicians yeah he says of course duh right who doesn't know this oh muggles don't know this that's what he says exactly so let's get to the super chats thank you guys for supporting the show tonight wow we got up to almost 900 uh which i didn't expect so that's great to have such a wide audience out here tonight. Scroll back to Orthodoxy Chloroquine, $25. Jay, this is great. Many thanks for helping with these issues. How powerful is the tag argument in deconstructing and ultimately destroying this paradigm amongst other demonic lies that the Satan author of this essay wishes to reveal and bring to pass? Well, I, I think by the end of the discussion, you did hear a pre basic presuppositional critique of the philosophic assumptions of this kind of a position, right? Because if there's no good, right, if the good is just transferred to being the evil, one problem is that even if I think that my own desires are the highest good, that's still a highest good. And so now we're in a position of how we're going to give an account for being and the good and objective standards if our whole position is predicated on denying objective standards. Now there's no such thing as the good. There's only my tastes and my desires, which are just epiphenomena, right? They're just projections of my mind or my subconscious. That's what Carl Jung's going to say too, by the way. Carl Jung has no different worldview than these people. It doesn't matter whether Carl Jung was a, like a Satanist or not. Like he has the same worldview, <laughs> right? Uh, and he says, oh, it's just a projection of your mind. So the skilled magician is the guy who can change his mind to can to change the projector, right? It's like your mind's a projector and you're just watching, a, your life is like a projection screen that you're watching, right? Club Silencio, <laughs> that's what that's what Club Silencio is about in Mulholland Drive. And so uh, if you just change the projection through changing your mind, you'll change reality, dude, right? It's literally that dumb, okay? Well, no. Uh, just changing your mind and just willing something really hard or, oh, if you do these rituals, right, it'll, it'll magically change the world. No, uh, it doesn't actually change the world, but evil and giving yourself over to evil power does have an effect in the world. But it's not forever. It's a temporary thing. And evil destroys you, right? Evil doesn't give what it promises. It's sort of like, all these, these people think that they're going to, you know, buddy up with the devil or something. And then the devil screws you over and you're like, why would you screw me over? Because I'm the devil, dude. <laughs> I screw people over. That's what I do. Right? It's the story of the turtle and the snake. Is that or the, tur the turtle and the scorpion? You know, that, that stupid story about, you know, I carried you across the river. Why did you sting me and kill me? Because I'm a scorpion. That's what I do. So, interestingly, the 
refusal to accept the existence of evil by the normie is the very thing that allows evil to R-A-P-E the normie. Yeah, exactly. Mar Marta Grazk, $10. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Palantir, $5. Jay, I heard you mention that Orthodox Christianity is not egalitarian in nature. Correct. With this in mind, what is the proper understanding of egalitarian parables such as the workers in the vineyard? Okay, well, two things, both things are true, right? So the workers in the vineyard parable points out that it's possible for a person to be rewarded who hasn't worked as long as a person who has worked their whole life based on the value of the work, right? So it's not totally egalitarian because Paul says in the eschaton, star will differ from star in brightness based on the reward. Not everybody has the same reward. Gold, silver, and straw. The straw gets burnt up, right? In fact, in other parables, Christ also says that some will bear fold 30, right? 60, and 100. So even the other parables point out that there's differentiation. But the difference is that that parable, I think, is talking about the quality of one's work. Irish Cringe Lord, $2. Jay, I love your work. You remind me of a young Tucker. I'll have to do that. I'm trying to do the Tucker stare. <laughs> do you believe that uh, Noah's uh, flood was worldwide? Yes, you can read uh, the, what is it, Enuma Elish. You can read the you know ancient Babylonian uh, accounts. You can read the ancient Chinese account. So we got China. We got ancient Near East. We got accounts of the flood in Latin South America. Yes, I believe it was a... How all that works, I don't know. But I think there is a good amount of evidence that it was a global flood. Uh, what is a book on that? Um, there's a book. What is it? I can't, I can't even see it. I've got a book. Actually, just read Sir from Rose, Genesis Creation Early, man. Uh, there is a book, but I can't find it. It's over there where I can't see um, Doorman three sixty five dollars. I'm really glad you decided to cover this. It reminds me how our lives are in a engaged in a spiritual battle. Yeah, and it, isn't it interesting that although in a sense this this person being evil is blinded ultimately, there's a degree to which the evil people who are really into their evil they can kind of see more than most of the so called Christians, uh, precisely because. This is a person who, you know, had a lot of criminal contacts in the organized crime world and the, you know, political world. So he, he, he's seen a lot of evil people and a lot of evil people in power. And so from that vantage point, he can, I guess, see uh, more so about what's going on in the world than a lot of Christians, uh, which doesn't make his evil worldview correct. It's just that he has a vantage point and an angle that a lot of people don't have, which allowed him, I think, to see, you know, Unfortunately, how the fallen world works. Put it that way. Mikhail, the king of kings, $20. Young boomer, Luciferian vampire slayer. Uh, yes, and I, I'm just like Sarah Michelle Geller. Literally. Literally just like Sarah Michelle Geller. Call me Buffy. Thank you. Tira Faison, $10. Thank you for your work. God bless. <laughs> Thank you. Tira, I, I'm not even phased by that Faison. Super chat, thank you. Well, Emmanuel, five dollars. Shout out, Well, Emmanuel, long time super chatter. We got we got a lot of the the old school homies in the chat. The homies in the chat. What's up, homies? Be sure and hit like and share if you would, because we got a huge crowd. We don't usually get this on a Wednesday night, but it's a hot topic, right? So if you would hit like and share, and are you planning to do videos on Revelation? Well, as we know, the Apocalypse is a very uh, difficult book. Um, I don't think I would be ready to really get into it uh, until I had read a lot more of the text that I want to read. Um, so maybe one day, but not anytime soon. So um, I want to read both of Lightheart's commentaries on Revelation before I do that. Um, and there was another book. Oh, my godfather is actually writing a book on Apocalypse right now, too. So, uh, and he's doing that because he actually got, he bought the 
James Jordan estate, not the estate itself, but like the rights to the books. And I'm sure a lot of you guys know who James Jordan is. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and he was telling me about all this, you know, a few months ago that he was going to, because James Jordan's in bad health. So he's, I'm assuming he's going to pass away soon. So he wants to take a lot of that uh, insight from Jordan, who, who's very insightful, uh, and himself produce a book probably in the next five or ten years. So I would want to read Dean's book, too, and Lightheart's books before I would ever try to go into uh, my own analysis of Apocalypse. But if you want a broad outline of it, uh, you know, I agree largely with what's in uh, Gentry's book, Before Jerusalem Fell. And what's in Chilton's book, Days of Vengeance. Um, that would be, you know, roughly where I put things right now. Uh, Green Waves, $5. Uh, American Horror Story Apocalypse. I did a video, actually, on AHS, that series. Because, actually, you're right. What is in that se- And I'm not recommending that season of that series. It's, it's, it's pretty brutal. <laughs> but um, that season is about the satanic aeon. And it's like... The elites destroy everything, go in underground bunkers. They're in the underground bunkers while the world is like full of poison gases or something. And then they come back out, right, to set up the new satanic Aeon. So absolutely, you're absolutely correct. Uh, that season of American Horror Story was literally about what we're talking about tonight. 100% totally. And I would venture to bet that the people who wrote that season, I don't, even, I don't know who it was. They're 100% totally agreeing with this guy. <laughs> I think so. Uh, Brian Gumble, what's up, dude? Uh, our favorite TV man. I'm sure that's not the real Brian Gumble, but uh, isn't it Bryant Gumble or is it Brian Gumble? I don't know. Two dollars. Uh, good stream, Jay. Uh, fascinating video with Brian Callen and Sam Tripoli. That was a fascinating video. Wasn't it? I would love to see a part two. Yeah, uh, they talked about a part two back when we did that episode. If you don't know, of course, we did a. Uh, hour and a half back and forth with Brian Callen, well-known comedian Brian Callen, playing the skeptic and me playing the conspiracy theorist. And uh, it was a great episode. Uh, everybody on Rockfin liked that one. So if you haven't seen that, definitely go check that out over at uh, Conspiracy Social Club on Rockfin. And I, I, I would imagine, hopefully, we can do another episode. Dawn Dr- Deary. 10 bucks. Great show. Thank you, Don Derry. Much appreciated. It's human milk vegan since $5 and says silence. Shh. Right? The sign of Hippocrates. Silence. Dangerfield Hensley, $9.11. Cool numbers, dude. I'm sensing there's some significance there. JD, would you consider doing uh, the Brandon Cronenberg film Possessor? Actually, Jamie and I talked about watching. Brandon Cronenberg's movie the other day. I have not seen Possessor, but yes. In fact, I'm going to actually, I'm going to send an email and see if he would come on uh, an interview. I mean, I have no idea if he would, but um, you say that it is about MK Ultra DID Illuminate Confirm. That's what I figured. Uh, so, yes, we'll try to watch it. And then if it's not too gross, I can't, if the movies are too gross, I can't watch them. So, but we'll see. Jay Mel sends 30 bucks and says, is. Alistair actually emulating ancient rituals and practices or using this as an excuse for a made up pseudo religion? Uh, Probably a little bit of both. I mean, I think in a sense he was recreating real ancient pagan practices with a lot of the bodily fluid type stuff. Uh, And I also think at the same time, it's kind of a create your own cult. Yeah, it's both of those things. Those aren't mutually exclusive, so I think it's both. But thank you for that, JML. Big Bala, Big Bala, five dollars. Do you see any signs of that? The G L O B O H losing power. I have heard people saying it. Uh, I don't know. It's it's difficult to tell uh, because it's possible that these groups have overplayed their hand. But it's also poss- It's also hard to gauge it because the world's a big place, and you know some countries are uh, having a conservative reaction and these kinds of things. And I think what we have to be aware of is that remember in lockstep they have planned for the 
anti-global elite reaction. They know we're going to be mad. Klaus said it. I know you're angry. We know you're angry. We want you to be angry. We want you to cry against the government, right? So remember, it's not Trudeau and it's not Biden. And it's not these government goobers that are running the show. And Klaus and company want you to be, they're, they're the ones that, they're the lightning rods that take all your energy and anger, right? You're the two minutes of hate from 1984, right? Uh, they're not really running things. So I don't know. Good question, but I don't know. All right. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed tonight's show. If you want to see the uh, full show, uh, I'll have part two. Uh, analyzing this essay up in the next day or two. So subscribe to Jay's Analysis for four ninety five a month, $60 a year. You get full access to the archives, the streams, the interviews, all of the stuff that we've talked about for the last five years, all the 50-plus global elite writings. Get your uh, master's degree in globalism through Jay University at jaysanalysis.com. You can also uh, buy the books and... Uh, get signed copies of the books and thoughts of a pilgrim three dollars here's a great book on revelation revelation the books from zoe press okay well i don't know i haven't read that book so i can't recommend that but thank you for that recommendation i'll definitely take a look at it zoe press and uh, of course also if you want access go subscribe on rockfin for some of that unique exclusive content over there guys because we did do a pretty deep dive into uh, history of MK Ultra operations in Australia, and you can watch that here if you sign up on my rock, my ROK. Really excellent based uh, free speech based platform. We love Rockfin, big fans of Rockfin. Also, uh, show sponsor chalk.com. Be sure and uh, support our bros over at chalk. They uh, are, we're working on them becoming really big sponsors of Jay's analysis. So shout out to our bros over there. You can use the promo code J-A-Y if you've lost your mojo. And I think probably a lot of you guys have, not everybody, a lot of mojo in this audience, but if your mojo is lacking, you can retain, regain, build up, explode some of that mojo with chalk.com. Some of the most legit, she legit mushrooms out there. These guys are great. Look at all of those hundreds and hundreds of five-star reviews. Go and use the promo code there in that link, J-A-Y, and you will get a discount. So thank you to, uh, to our sponsors, Chalk.com. And everybody have a good night. And uh, uh, yeah, realize, realize that this is what's going on. <laughs>